This might look like an oversized neon version of Donkey Kong, but it's actually how I'm handing out candy this year. Instead of kids just ringing my doorbell and shouting trick or treat, they'll have to earn their candy by playing my over-engineered version of Plinko. If they happen to land the ball in the green basket, they're going to win the most sought out Halloween prize of them all, the legendary full-size chocolate bar. But first, let's rewind a bit and see how I build this thing and how it actually works, today on Techavoo. Hey everyone and welcome to Techavoo. Halloween is my favorite holiday, and this year I wanted to upgrade my candy distribution process by adding a little bit of tech and fun into the mix. More specifically, I wanted the trick-or-treaters to earn their keep this year. There are a few ground rules for this project. 1. I don't want anyone to lose. It's Halloween. Everybody should get candy. We're in the 21st century. Participation points for all. 2. Age doesn't matter. I want a 4-year-old and a 14-year-old to have the same chance of winning, but there will be a little bit of skill involved. 3. It needs to be fast. This isn't a Costco free sample table. I don't want there to be huge lineups in front of my house. Speaking of Costco, while I was stocking up on Halloween candy, inspiration struck. Sitting there in the aisle next to a 12-pack of kayaks was a giant oversized Plinko board. It was just begging to be Tekavood. If you've ever watched The Price is Right, you know exactly what Plinko is. You drop a ball from the top, gravity takes over, and then the pegs send the ball bouncing unpredictably, and hopefully it lands in the prize slot. So today we're building the Tekka Tree, a tech-infused version of Plinko that's designed specifically for trick-or-treaters. To make it Halloween friendly though, I'm going to need to make a few changes. I'm going to need to build this tough enough so that it can survive a night of kids and their sugar-fueled chaos. Instead of kids dropping a ball from the top, there's going to be a table set up with a giant button. You press the button and the ball rolls into play automatically. At the bottom there's going to be three baskets, two purple ones for regular treats, and then a green neon one for that coveted full-size chocolate bar. Unlike classic Plinko and its pegs, my version is going to use a rail system that directs the ball. And two of those rails are actually going to move. To win, you're going to need to time your shot perfectly and hope that gravity is in your favor. I think older kids are going to try to line up the shot perfectly to win those 85 grams of sugar, while the little ones are just going to mash the button and win out of sheer luck. Either way, it's going to be a fun Halloween night and I get a 10 minute video out of it. My Amazon package just arrived, so let's take a look at what I got and which parts I ultimately forgot. Before we get into the electronics though, this is my trusty plywood board. This is where everything will get mounted. I'm going to paint it black though so it looks a little bit more like Halloween and less like a Home Depot aisle. The first thing I have is a DS3218 servo motor. This one will be in charge of dispensing the balls one at a time. A servo motor is very different from a regular motor. Its whole purpose is to move at very precise angles. Next up is this pair of MG996Rs. They sort of sound like printer error codes, but they're also servo motors. These ones will be in charge of moving parts of the ramps up and down. This adds a little bit of randomness and skill to the game. Without them, the balls would always land in the same spot. Next up, we have our power supply, and this one is adjustable. I just need to make sure I set it to 6 volts, which is what the servos expect. Anything higher than that, and we're going to have a 15 second smoke show instead of a glorified candy dispenser. This is the inline fuse. Its entire job is to take one for the team. If something goes wrong, the fuse will die, but everything else will survive. These are wires, and I'm not talking about flimsy wires here. These are the kind of wires that you'd find in a car. When you're using automotive wiring for your candy dispenser, you know it's legit. And finally, the ESP32, which is the brains of the operation. It's about the size of a cracker, but it costs less than your typical Starbucks order. This will drive all the motors, and it will make sure that they're all in sync. Oh, I almost forgot. We also need a capacitor. This is sort of like a battery that has the memory of a goldfish. It can hold a little bit of a charge and it'll distribute it evenly to help the electronics from frying. So that's the lineup. Together they're going to turn into an over-engineered candy dispenser or a garage fire. I guess we'll find out shortly. Now that all the parts are ready, it's time for my favorite step, the wiring. There's a lot of wires in this build and only so much faith I can put in one single fuse. I followed the schematic and hoped that my voltage map would hold up once everything was powered. Now I just need everything else to cooperate. Thankfully, all the servos run on 6 volts, and my power supply does as well, so everything can share the same line without any converters. I marked where all the servo motors should go, mostly based on intuition. And now the actual fun part, power tools. I'm going to use my plunge router to carve out some holes. I'm not aiming for perfection, the holes just need to be roughly the right size so that the servo motors can pop in without any protest. Let's blow off that sawdust. Et voila, a perfect fit, not bad at all. I'll use my drill to create a pilot hole, and then the impact driver will secure them into place. Now it's time to paint the plywood black so that it fits our theme. Don't worry about all of those streaks, the wood should absorb all that excess liquid. And now the moment of truth. 
does it actually work? I really should have tested this earlier. Uh oh. Oh right, I forgot. I set a 3 second delay so that nothing would jam up at startup. I have my trusty little plywood over here which I painted black. You can see that the servo motors have been affixed to it right now. I also have these pieces of wood that I'm going to attach onto the plywood and then when you drop the ball, it should go down like a ramp. Hopefully not like that. In the final version, I'm going to cut these down and paint them black and I'm also going to attach some UV strips to them so that they glow in the dark. Having said all of that, I don't think I'm going to use wood for the ramps for this project. I have another idea in mind, but I'm going to need to mock it out to see if it even makes sense. We've covered the mechanical parts, now let's talk plastics. First up, it's the ball dispenser. I went through five different designs before realizing that I didn't really need to reinvent the wheel. This design is simple and it works. Next up are the rails, which are no longer made out of wood. They're now inspired by the Donkey Kong arcade game. They include small ramps to hopefully keep the ball from rolling off. Then there's the paddle. I went with a nostalgic pinball look. Each one rotates back and forth at very precise angles, opening up a different pathway. Going back to the Donkey Kong theme, we have our ladders. Each has a wall on either side to redirect the ball down one level. Next are the buckets. No matter which path you take, you'll end up in one of these and you'll leave with a sugar rush. And finally our ball, which is airless. I grabbed one online and scaled it down to fit the setup. These things are seriously awesome. They work just like real balls, but they look way cooler. So that's it, five parts in one ball. While they sprint, let's hop over to Procreate and mock up what this will look like on the real plywood. Let's start by designing our mock. On the top, there's going to be two rails that act like ramps. This is where we place all of our balls. Next up is the ball dispenser. It'll grab one ball at a time and roll them into play. The balls will roll down these rails until they hit their first obstacle, this ladder. They'll hit the side of the ladder and then bounce into our first decision maker. When the paddle is upright, it acts like a bridge and brings you to the top pathway. This is actually not where you want to go. Instead, you're going to want to wait until the paddle is open to make your way towards victory. It's going to roll down these rails and hit a bunch of ladders until it makes it to the middle. Now let's focus on the alternate path. I'm going to have this large fall over here with two ladders and I'm hoping there won't be a huge bounce. This path will also bring you to the middle of the gameplay, but the ladder over here will prevent you from going any further. This will bring you down to our second paddle. Again, there will be a bridge or open position. Either way, you're going to land into a purple basket. This is what the projected pathway looks like if you want to win. If you don't have enough momentum or the paddle's open, you'll land into the purple basket. After a few days of printing, everything is almost done and it looks pretty good so far. I want to start by testing out the ball dispenser to see if it even works. This is super satisfying. I could just watch this all day. I should loop this. I used some masking tape to temporarily hold everything in place. Once I was happy, I secured everything with some screws. I did run into a little bit of a problem though. Take a look at my finger here. This path is supposed to bring you straight down or to the right, but the little screw over here bounces you off to the left, giving you a victory. To fix it though, there's a very simple solution. I'll just add an extra rail on the left hand side here. Now that everything's set up, let's see how the final version compares to the mock-up. It's pretty close, right? I added a few extra rails to make it look a little bit more polished, and I adjusted a couple of the angles, but honestly, it just kind of worked. I didn't mention this earlier, but I didn't just use any kind of filament for this project. This is Phosphorescent Pet G. It glows under UV light. If you've ever been to a glow-in-the-dark mini putt, you know exactly the kind of vibe I'm going for. The only issue is that I can't cover it with a plexiglass to keep the balls from jumping out. Plexiglass blocks most UV light. There are special UV-friendly options out there, but I'm out of time. I really need to get this project out before Halloween. So instead, I'm going to go old school and tilt the plywood back a little bit. I'm hoping that gravity will be in my favor. There's one last piece left to this project, and that's the button. I want there to be a big button on the table that's lit up. Once you press the button, the dispenser releases one ball and your turn starts. The button's going to sit on this box, which is going to sit on top of the table in front of the Tekka tree. If all goes well, the table will keep the kids from getting too close. This has been quite a journey, so let's light it up and see how this whole thing works together. I'm not gonna lie, this looks considerably better than I expected. It looks pretty awesome in person. I'm not sure if that's coming through on the camera or not. We're coming close to the end of the project here, but there's one last thing I wanted to talk about, and that's the jackpot itself. How often does somebody actually win? I've designed the game so that it's harder to land in the green bucket, but at the same time, I didn't want it to be too hard. I didn't want it to feel like a carnival scam. There's more to the jackpot than meets the eye though. Let me show you what I mean. 
Earlier in the video, there was a caption that said that a regular prize is worth three mini bars. But how much candy is that really? Three mini caramels weigh in at 32 grams, while a full-size caramel comes in at 51 grams. That's about 1.6 times more if you win the jackpot. But that's not always the case. Let's take a look at dairy milks. Three mini dairy milks come in at 56 grams, while a full-size dairy milk comes in at 39 grams. That's a 40% loss if you win a jackpot. So depending on the brand, the jackpot might actually be a downgrade. Since I'm handing these out at random, I guess a real name for this build shouldn't be the Tekka Treat, but rather the Tekka Trick. So that's it for now. The Tekka Treat decides who gets a full-size bar and who gets a life lesson in probability. If you see a glowing Plinko board in someone's yard this Halloween, it's probably mine. Come say hi. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more projects like this one. Thanks for watching. Happy Halloween, and I'll see you next build.